Beer has been brewed domestically for thousands of years. It developed independently in almost every major civilization. It was a major dietary staple in the American colonies. Most early American homes included a small room dedicated to brewing. Many of our nation's founders were home brewers, including George Washington, James Madison, and Thomas Jefferson. Beer continued to be a huge component to the daily diet for most Americans, including children, through the 1800s. The advent of clipper ships and refrigeration brought Bavarian yeasts and brewing techniques to commercial breweries in the 1850s. These German-style lagers dominate the bulk of the American commercial beer market even today. By the 1870s, there were over 4,000 breweries. The passing of Prohibition in 1920 sparked a sudden demand for ingredients used in home brew. Many breweries turned to the production of these products, marketing them as being useful in breads and desserts. Congress intended to legalize homebrew beer along with wine in the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, but the words and or beer were left out of the final print. In the mid-1970s, a desire for beers that, at the time, were only available abroad coupled with a national beer shortage due to the Anheuser-Busch bottlers' strike, created the perfect environment for a homebrew revival. President Jimmy Carter legalized homebrew beer in 1978 by signing H.R. 1337. The bill contained an amendment sponsored by Senator Alan Cranston exempting beer brewed at home from taxation. This opened up importation of brewing supplies from the U.K., fueling the creativity of many home brewers that went on to build craft breweries. In 2013, home brewing became legal in all 50 states. Today, there are an estimated 1.2 million home brewers in the United States. A majority of those started in the last 10 to 15 years. In just a few hours, you can brew a beer at home that is as good, if not better, than what is commercially available. In total, you will spend about four hours over a three-week period if we count the time it will take to clean, brew, and bottle. The beer will sit for two weeks while the sugars are converted to alcohol, and then another week in the bottle to clear and carbonate. We recommend starting with an equipment kit. They contain everything you'll need for your first brew, and you'll generally save a little by buying it all together. Equipment starter kits cost around $150, and ingredient kits cost between $25 and $45. You can reduce the cost of ingredients by moving into more advanced types of brewing. Most recipes have ingredients that are added at different stages, so a timer may be useful. Cloth bags can be used with these additions to reduce sediment. A kitchen scale and measuring cup is also handy for weighing out and measuring ingredients. If your equipment kit does not include a kettle, you'll need one that is at least equal in volume to the batch size, 5 gallons. Most any type of pot can be used. If you go with aluminum, however, do not use brewery cleaning products on it as it will oxidize. Most kits will include a device called a hydrometer, used for determining alcohol content. It can be used directly in a liquid container, but is easier to read in a tall jar. These jars can be easily filled using a turkey baster. Spray bottles make for a convenient way to sanitize on the fly. A notebook is highly recommended. It gives you something to refer back to as you tweak recipes. Finally, you'll need bottles. An amber color works best because they block light that reacts with hops, producing a skunky aroma. Save bottles that use pry-off caps, and you can reuse them with the capper included in the equipment kit. You'll need a little over two cases, or 48 bottles, for a five-gallon batch. We'll cover additional equipment that can make the process easier and faster as we use them in this tutorial. Safety can be overlooked in home brewing. 
The following tips have been compiled as a result of the most common mistakes. Take precautions while brewing to avoid contact with high temperatures. Leave room in the kettle to avoid boil overs. Avoid carrying containers that are too heavy to manage. If possible, use gravity or a pump to transfer liquids. Use high temperature hose with boiling liquids. Regular tubing can melt and burst. Use caution when uncapping bottles. Mistakes can result in overcarbonation. Keep hops out of reach from your pets as they are toxic to dogs and cats. Nitrile gloves are recommended while working with strong acids like cleaning chemicals. Carriers are recommended when transporting glass carboys. There are four main ingredients in beer, malt, water, hops, and yeast. Malt is made from cereal grain, typically barley. Oat, rye, sorghum, millet, and others are occasionally used for specialty style beers. A measurement scale introduced by Joseph Lovabon in the 1860s is often used to identify color. Water will account for over 90% of the finished beer. If you live in an area where the water has a strong iron or sulfur taste, we recommend using a filter. When using tap water directly, we recommend crushing half a Camden tablet and adding it to the water you have collected for brewing. This removes chlorine and chloramine used in treating municipal water. Hops are climbing plants, or vines. Hop flowers, which look like papery pine cones, give beer its distinctive smell and bitterness. They are used in beer as both a spice and a preservative. Hop packages are labeled with alpha and beta acids in percentages of the total weight of the hop. Alpha acids are the primary source of bitterness in beer and contribute to a good head. Beta acids contribute to bitterness as the beer ages. Hops are available in dried whole leaf form and in pellets called T90s. Pellets are generally preferred. They are a more stable product and less susceptible to spoilage. Beer recipes often include an IBU measurement indicating the amount of bitterness derived from hops. Noble hops are classic European varieties that are responsible for the signature flavors of Pilsner and other continental lagers. The four noble varieties are Halatawa Middlefru, Tetnang, Spalt, and Zotz. There are hundreds of hop varieties grown around the world each with their own unique tastes and aromas. While most modern beers include hops, there are some historical styles that use other ingredients, including spruce beer, Groot, and Sati. Store hops in a freezer to extend their life. Yeast are a single-celled fungi. They have the important job of breaking down sugar, leaving alcohol, carbon dioxide, and a variety of flavors in a process called fermentation. There are three species of yeast typically used in brewing, ale, lager, and sour. Each require different temperatures and conditions to perform its job. Belonging to these species are hundreds of strains to choose from. Each strain will produce a unique set of flavors in your beer. Specific strains of bacteria are also used in the brewing of sour beers. Yeast is best stored in the refrigerator. We recommend an ingredient kit for your first brew. These kits come in a wide variety of styles. Ales make great first beers as they don't require the low temperatures needed in making lagers. One of the most important steps to successful home brewing is proper cleaning and sanitizing. We recommend cleaning with a product originally developed for Coors called PBW or Powdered Brewery Wash. Use 1 to 2 ounces per gallon for cleaning kettles, 3 fourths of an ounce per gallon for fermenters, kegs, tanks, and other equipment. Soak equipment overnight in PBW solution and rinse the following morning. No scrubbing is required. After the surfaces have been cleaned, they can then be sanitized with a product like Star San. 
A dilution of as little as one ounce to five gallons of water is sufficient. Allow 30 seconds of contact time. No rinsing is required. Your kit will usually include a sample of these chemicals, in addition to brushes for removing any stuck-on material in carboys, bottles, and other equipment. Previously used bottles are probably the most tedious thing to clean. A bottle washer and tree can help with that. Of course, new bottles are always available as well. Everything that touches your beer needs to be sanitized. With all your equipment cleaned and sanitized, it's time to start your brew. Take a look at the recipe included in your kit and make a note of when the hops and other ingredients should be added. Times are denoted in the length of time from the end of the boil. For example, a hop addition at 60 minutes in a 60 minute boil will be added right at the beginning. A hop addition at 45 minutes in a 16 minute boil will be added 15 minutes into the boil, letting it boil for 45 minutes. Make a note of the optimal fermentation temperature indicated on the yeast package as well. The recipe should also provide original and final gravity numbers. Note these down, we'll discuss their importance later. The kit will also include six to nine pounds of dry or liquid extract. This is the base ingredient you'll be using for your beer. If you're using liquid extract, place the container in hot water so that it will easily pour. Start heating three gallons of water in your brewing kettle. If your ingredient kit includes crushed grains, place them in a muslin bag. You can tie the end of the bag to the pot handle to keep the bag from burning on the bottom of the pot. Steep the grains between 150 and 158 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 to 30 minutes. Remove the grain bag and let it drain out. Take the pot off the burner and pour in the extract. Mix continually while adding the extract. We now have what brewers call wort. Bring the wort to boil, stirring every few minutes. Add hops at the time specified in the recipe. Don't cover the pot. Boiling releases volatile compounds that produce off flavors in the finished beer. As the temperature increases, a smooth foam will form on top of your wort. Spraying cold water and stirring will keep the foam from rising over the top or boiling over. Shortly after this point, proteins coagulate, making the wort look a bit like egg drop soup. This is called hot break. A tablespoon of Irish moss or tablet of whirlflock can be added in the last 10 to 15 minutes to help clarify the beer. After an hour has passed, turn off the burner and let the boil end before moving the pot. During the boil, you achieved a hot break that will help reduce chill haze or a foggy look in your finished beer. You're now going to chill the wort as quickly as possible. Just like in the hot break, you'll see proteins group together and drop to the bottom. This is the cold break. Chilling the wort quickly also reduces the chances of wild yeast or bacteria contaminating the beer. You can accomplish this with an ice bath, placing the pot in another container filled with cold ice water or by using a wort chiller. Wort chillers are available in a few different types and make this process quick and easy. They typically connect to a standard garden hose and use cold water to quickly lower the temperature of the wort. Bring the pot up to full volume by adding cold water. When the wort is cooled between 70 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, transfer the wort using an auto siphon into a fermenter, either a glass carboy or food grade bucket. Brewers refer to this as racking. Try to stay off the sediment bed by keeping the siphon about an inch from the bottom of the pot. This is also a good time to take a hydrometer reading and compare it to the original gravity specified in the recipe. We'll cover how to do this in detail later. Add oxygen or aerate by shaking the fermenter for 45 seconds. While yeast can live anaerobically, that is, without oxygen, they require it to adjust to the environment in the wort. Under attenuated fermentation, or fermentation where all of the sugars have not been converted, may result from low oxygen levels. Some home brewers use pure oxygen bottles for this step. 
degassing tools used in winemaking to remove suspended carbon dioxide can also be used in place of shaking to aerate wort. Just attach to a drill and let spin. This method eliminates the risk of accidentally dropping the carboy. Pour or pitch the yeast and affix an airlock or blow-off tube to the fermenter. Both liquid and dry yeast can be pitched directly into wort, but a starter is suggested when using liquid. We'll explain how to make a yeast starter later. Airlocks and blow-off tubes allow gases released from the fermentation to escape while preventing air from entering and potentially spoiling the beer. Airlocks come in two varieties, three-piece and bubble. A three-piece airlock is suggested at this point, but there are some occasions when a blow-off tube may be needed. If your recipe specifies an original gravity of more than 1.060, if there is very little headspace, empty space left in the top of the fermenter, or if you're using a Hefeweizen or Belgian yeast, a blow-off tube will prevent the fermentation from overflowing through the airlock. Attach a hose to the barb inside of the airlock and submerge the other end in a jar of water or diluted sanitizer. Place the fermenter in a cool place away from light. Check the temperature when you see bubbling in the airlock, indicating active fermentation. Some yeasts will start in a few hours, others can take up to 48. This period of time is called the lag phase, during which the yeast adjusts to their new environment and undergo high growth. With the airlock bubbling away, the yeast have now entered the exponential growth phase which will last one to four days. This is when the sugars are consumed and alcohol and CO2 is produced. At the height of this activity, the beer is said to be at high Krausen, Krausen being the thick foamy head in the top of the fermenter. Stay as close to the optimum fermentation temperature as possible during this stage. Place the fermenter in a tub of water or wrap it in a wet towel to lower the temperature. Some home brewers use a spare refrigerator and temperature controller to achieve optimal fermentation conditions. Yeast produce a class of molecules called esters at higher than recommended temperatures, leading to fruity aromas and flavors in your beer. If the temperature is too cold, the yeast will go dormant. After two to six days, or when the bubbling rate in the airlock drops to one to five a minute, you have the option of transferring your beer into a secondary fermenter. This improves clarity by reducing the amount of sediment in the finished beer. It is suggested if your recipe calls for dry hops or dry spices, that is, hops or additives added at this stage. Use an auto siphon to rack the beer into a secondary fermenter, being careful not to agitate the beer, which adds oxygen. You want as little empty space, or head space, on the top as possible. In the primary, a protective layer of CO2 is formed. The yeast will rebuild this layer in the secondary. With the completion of the exponential growth phase, we now have green beer. The beer is referred to as green because it does not yet have an acceptable balance of flavors. In the last phase, the stationary phase, the yeast clean up after themselves. They absorb some of the byproducts created in earlier phases, like diacetyl. You will sometimes hear this phase referred to as the diacetyl rest. Now, we wait for the yeast and other sediment suspended in the beer to flocculate, group together, and sink to the bottom. This will take a few days. Is your beer ready to bottle? The best way to tell is to take a hydrometer reading. Place a sample of your wort into a hydrometer test jar. Spin the hydrometer while placing it into the jar to remove any bubbles that might be clinging to it. With the sample at eye level, look to see where the liquid crosses the markings. If the reading is lower or matches the final gravity specified in your recipe, congratulations, you are ready to bottle. If not, wait a few days and check again. A hydrometer measures the density of beer relative to water. Hydrometers will read 1 on the specific gravity scale in 60 degree Fahrenheit distilled water. 
Specific gravity is the scale most home brewers use in the United States. Your hydrometer may also read in bricks or balling and potential alcohol. The balling scale is not typically used in the U.S. ABV, alcohol by volume, can be calculated by subtracting final gravity from original gravity and multiplying by 131, or simply subtracting the first reading from the second using the potential alcohol scale. Temperatures below or above 60 degree Fahrenheit will throw the reading off a bit. Use the chart included with your hydrometer to correct the reading. With fermentation complete, you now have the option to bottle or keg your beer. Kegging is a quick and easy alternative to bottling. It requires an initial investment, usually $200 to $250, and some space in a refrigerator. Bottled beer is easy to give away and carry to parties. Plus, entries for homebrew contests need to be packaged in bottles. If bottling, you'll need to add a little sugar or prime. The yeast will use this sugar to produce CO2, carbonating the beer. Boil three-fourths of a cup of priming sugar in two cups of water for five minutes and let cool. Pour the cooled liquid into the bottom of your empty bottling bucket. The bottling bucket is a regular brew bucket with a spigot attached near the bottom. Pre-measured carbonation drops can also be used. Just drop a single piece into each 12-ounce bottle. Using an auto-siphon, rack the beer out of the fermenter and into a bottling bucket, carefully staying off of the sediment or trube at the bottom. If you are kegging, rack the beer into the keg. Attach a hose between the faucet on the bottling bucket and a bottle filler or bottling wand. If you are using carbonation drops, you can attach the bottle filler directly to the auto siphon and skip the bottling bucket. Insert the bottle filler into a bottle, then open the spigot and press the bottle filler against the bottom of the bottle to start the flow. Avoid splashing, which introduces new oxygen, and use a sanitizer to prevent bacteria or wild yeast from entering the beer. Fill the bottles all the way to the top, leaving about an inch of space when the bottle filler is removed. Remove the bottle filler and place a cap on the bottle. Leave the caps loosely on the top of the bottles for a few minutes before capping them. This will allow some of the carbon dioxide in the beer to displace the air left in the bottle, improving the shelf life of your beer. Cap and let sit for two to three weeks at room temperature. Your bottles will not carbonate in the refrigerator if you are using ale yeast. If your carbonation seems fine after three weeks, that seems to be overcarbonated after five to six weeks on a consistent basis, reduce the amount of priming sugar. To keg, you will need a kegging system consisting of a CO2 bottle, a regulator, keg disconnects, some hose, and a tap. After filling the keg, connect the gas and set the pressure to around 11 psi. The beer will be ready to serve in three to five days. An average 5-pound CO2 cylinder will last through about 50 gallons of beer. You can use higher pressures to carbonate faster. Just reduce them when the beer is ready to serve. When tasting your beer, we encourage you to compare it to the style guidelines published by the Beer Judge Certification Program. These are used in brewing competitions and will help you identify improvements while teaching you about the makeup of different styles. They also publish a fault list that can help you identify what happened when your beer tastes a little off. Visit the style section on craftbeer.com provided by the American Home Brewers Association for information on serving temperature, glassware, and food pairings. Making a yeast starter ensures that your yeast is healthy and increases the cell count. Boil four cups of water and a half a cup dried malt extract, DME, for about 10 minutes. Let the wort cool to room temperature and then pitch the yeast. 
Vigorously shake or swirl the container to get as much oxygen dissolved in the solution as possible. Cover the container with foil or use a foam stopper. Keep the starter at room temperature for 12 to 18 hours on a magnetic stir plate or occasionally shaking it to keep the solution aerated. When ready, pitch the starter into your wort. If you're using dry yeast, rehydrating it in water before pitching is recommended. Boil one cup of water and then mix the yeast when the temperature cools to 95 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Wort made from extract can produce an excellent beer. We suggest starting with this method to get an idea of what to expect from your home brew. In this next section, we'll introduce all grain brewing, a method for creating wort from crushed grain through a process called mashing. Before we dive into all grain brewing, let's revisit equipment. Here, you really have a lot of options. Keep in mind, however, that you are trying to accomplish two things filtering, and maintaining temperature. This can be accomplished many different ways, but as long as the time and temperature are right, they'll all work just fine. Modified water coolers are popular because the coolers are great at keeping a constant temperature. We call these mash tuns and we'll go over how they're used. A metal pot with a spigot can help with transferring liquid. Some of these also double as mash tuns. There are even all-in-one electric systems available that keep time and control temperatures automatically. Large mesh straining bags provide an inexpensive option to all-grain brewing using a process called brew in a bag. We'll explain everything that needs to occur in an all-grain process and some of the equipment you might use. All-grain brewing allows for complete creative control. You decide exactly what the beer is going to become, from color and aroma to flavor, mouthfeel, and all the complexities in between. Earlier, we presented a way to create wort using malt extract. In this next section, we'll make wort from scratch using all grain. It also costs less. You pay a little of a premium for the time that extract saves you. Cereal grain sold for brewing has been steeped in water for a number of days and allowed to sprout, or malted. The seeds sprout and the process establishes enzymes within the grain that will be used to convert starches into simple sugars by mashing. It is then put into a kiln to dry and roast. Different temperatures and times are used to produce a wide range of colors and flavors that you can use in your beers. You will need an all-grain beer recipe. Just like when making a sandwich, there are some general rules for particular styles. The Beer Judge Certification Program, BJCP, maintains guidelines for each style, and there are a lot of resources available online and in books for recipes. Base grains will make up the bulk of your recipe. They are the main source of fermentable sugars and the primary body and flavor of the beer. Specialty grains add colors, flavors, and textures to beer, but little fermentable sugars. Adjunct grains, such as corn and rice, can also be used, as well as additives, like fruit. Once you have the grain for your recipe, you'll need to mill it. Milling crushes the seeds, so the inside can have contact with water during mashing. Grain is often referred to as grist in reference to milling. With your grain in hand and your equipment cleaned and sanitized, you're ready to start the brew. The easiest method for all grain brewing is a technique called brew in a bag. For five gallon batches, at least a 10 gallon kettle is recommended. You will need room for about seven to seven and a half gallons of water plus the grain. Add the full seven and a half gallons of water to the kettle. Bring the temperature of the water to 10 degrees over the target mash temperature in the recipe, usually around 163 degrees Fahrenheit. When your strike water reaches the target temperature, turn off the heat source and stir the grains into the bag. After the grains have been added, 
the mass temperature should drop below 158 degrees. Cover the kettle and wait 60 minutes. When the 60 minutes is up, separate the grain from the liquid. Carefully lift the mesh bag out of the kettle. You now have pre-boil wort. With the exception of topping up, the process from this point is exactly the same as an extract brew. Topping up refers to the stage where the pot is brought up to full volume by adding cool water. Remember, everything that touches your beer needs to be sanitized. Brew in a bag is a great way to do all grain brewing. It requires minimal investment, cleanup is easy, and it doesn't take up much space. Next, we will show you how to brew using a common three-tier system. The advantages of this method are higher efficiency, meaning cheaper grain cost as you can use less, capacity for larger grain bills, and the ability to customize the equipment with features like pumps and automated temperature controllers. The main components of the system include the hot liquor tank, or HLT, the mash louder ton, or MLT, and the boil kettle. The HLT is used to heat water. In brewing terms, hot water is called liquor, hence the name hot liquor tank. The mash tun maintains a constant temperature while the crushed grains are soaked during starch to sugar conversion. They also provide a filter for separating the wort from the grist. The boil kettle is used to collect wort and perform the boil in which hops are added. First, you need to start heating some water. To determine how much, you need to know how much your grain weighs. You want a mash thickness of about one and a quarter to 1.38 quarts of water for every pound of grain. For example, if you have 13 and a half pounds of grain, multiply that by 1.32 quarts of water. 17.85 quarts or 4.5 gallons of water will be needed. The hot water will be used to bring the grist temperature between 140 and 158 degrees Fahrenheit, activating enzymes that will convert starches to sugar. This process is called the saccharification rest. Malted barley contains two types of starches, roughly 25% amylose and 75% amylopectin. You have two enzymes to work with, alpha and beta amylase. Alpha amylase is activated at higher temperatures. It randomly cleaves starch molecules into lesser sugars, only some of which are short enough to be fermentable. The leftover sugars provide for a rich, full-bodied beer. Beta amylase is activated at lower temperatures. It nips off maltose molecules from the ends of starch chains, producing shorter molecules that the yeast can easily digest, thus making the wort more fermentable. This results in a drier, leaner beer. Both enzymes are incapable of separating the branches depicted in green. Let the strike water temperature rise to about 10 degrees over the target mash temperature. When you reach this temperature, pour the water into the mash tun. Adjust the temperature as needed by adding cold or hot water. When ready, stir in the grain. Stirring in the grain will lower the temperature to the target range between 150 and 158 degrees Fahrenheit. Mashing with one target temperature is referred to as single infusion and utilizes the alpha and beta amylase enzymes discussed earlier. While not necessary, there are some other enzymes that can be activated using different temperatures. Phytase reduces the pH of the mash when activated for two to three hours but is not typically used due to the availability of acid malt that accomplishes the same task. Beta-glucanase breaks down the compounds that can cause a mash to be gummy. This takes about 15 to 30 minutes. Peptidase works to provide the wort with amino acid nutrients that will be used by the yeast. This range was once thought to break up proteins, however, most brewers do not believe significant protein degradation occurs in mashes held in this range today. You'll see this referred to as the protein rest in some literature. The standard time for this rest is 20 to 30 minutes. Stepping through the mash at these temperatures is called step mashing. There's also a third type of mashing called decoction, in which a portion of the grains are boiled and then returned to the mash. 
The method was used in Germany to achieve a step mash before the advent of thermometers and is still used today. Using pH strips, check the pH of the mash. Ideally, you want something close to 5.2. A tablespoon of stabilizer solution can be added to correct this if it is off. Let the grain sit for about an hour. While the mash is resting, start heating about 5 gallons of water to rinse the grain with, or sparge. We'll explain the math, but using the batch size for this volume works as a good rule of thumb. The grain will absorb about an eighth of a gallon of water per pound. So, for example, you will lose 1.7 gallons with 13.5 pounds of grain, 13.5 times 0.125. You will also lose about a half a gallon in the sediment or trube at the bottom of your mash tun. Subtract these two numbers from the total water you originally added to the mash. When you boil for an hour, you lose about one and a half gallons to evaporation. Just like in the mash tun, you'll also lose about a half a gallon to trube as well. So, add two to the amount of water needed for five gallons. For example, if you started with 4.5 gallons, and lost 2.3 gallons in the mash, add 2.7 gallons to bring the volume back up to 5 gallons, and then add another 2 to compensate for the loss. Use a little iodine to determine whether there is any residual starch that lacks conversion. Drop some iodine into a shallow sample of cool mash on a white dish. Be sure no grain material is present. This will yield a false positive. If the iodine color ranges from yellow to amber, conversion is complete. If the iodine turns dark purple to black, give the mash another 15 minutes and repeat the test. When conversion is complete, collect a pitcher of runnings and return them into the mash tun. Do this several times. This recirculation filters the wort and settles the grain bed in a process known as Vorloff. Slowly drain the wort into your kettle. When your sparge water reaches 175 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit, add it to the mash and stir. This will raise the mash temperature between 165 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit in a step called mashing out. This step thins the mash and halts enzyme activity. Temperatures above 170 degrees Fahrenheit can release tannins from broken husks, so try not to overshoot. Vorloff, once again, then drain the rest of the runnings into your kettle. It should be noted that there are two common methods used to sparge, fly, and batch. In fly sparging, the wort is slowly drained while water is evenly poured over the top of the grains at the same rate. This process is efficient in that it extracts most of the sugars, but is time-consuming, taking up to an hour or more. In batch sparging, the wort is first drained. Sparge water is then added and stirred into the grain bed. After sitting for about 10 minutes, the wort is vorloft and drained. Rice hulls are often mixed into the grain to prevent the sparge from becoming clogged or stuck. The combined process of mashing out, vorloff, and sparging is called loudering. That's it. You've created your own wort from scratch ready for the boil. Everything from this point on is exactly as it would be for an extract brew. Like learning how to cook or to play an instrument, home brewing is an avenue for personal growth. It can reward you with a truly exceptional product that can be shared with friends and family. It's a gateway to push yourself intellectually in a myriad of directions and blend with other skills and hobbies. Perhaps most importantly, it's a way to de-stress. Relax, don't worry, have a home brew. We hope you've enjoyed this introduction to brewing and that you'll come visit. We carry a complete selection of quality equipment and ingredients for making beer and a lot more. 
were located in San Dimas, California, off the 57 and 210 freeways.